Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel Physics Sergi and here we are in the Pathfinder Solution Series from the topic of rotation. I've been getting a lot of requests of uh, taking up Pathfinder rotation questions. Okay, so uh, in case you're new to this channel, I've already done quite a few. So you could see that there is a rotation playlist also uh, separately. And then please make sure you go through that. It's in the I button above. And for this particular problem, it's a, uh, a two a part problem. So one is from build up your understanding 39 and the second one is the check up your understanding 27, which uh, requires your understanding of rear wheel drive and four wheel drive. So we'll try to take up the concept and also the solution to both the uh, very interesting problems. Okay, right. So that's slightly tough. But once you get the concept, that's a cakewalk. Okay, so let's move ahead and see the formal wording of the question. In case you're reading this question for the first time, I would urge you to pause the video here, have a try, and then only come back to uh, look at the concept and the solution I'm going to provide. Okay, so uh, this is the 37th one, and then you can also try the 29th from check your understanding. Okay, right. So let's start with the 37th question. A rear wheel drive car of mass M, engine of Ma which delivers a constant power P, starts from rest on a straight level road. Quotient of friction between tires and the road is mu. If center of gravity of the car is close to the road and equidistant from all four wheels and the masses of the wheels are negligible as compared to the mass of the rest of the car, how does the speed of the car vary with the time as a function of time t? You should be able to judge. Okay, right. So we'll come back to the next question later. Let's move ahead with the understanding of what happens when a car starts and if it's a rear wheel drive, okay? So on the right-hand side, if I'm depicting a rear wheel drive with a free body diagram from a side view like this, actually the engine is powering only the back wheels. Imagine you were to lift this car in the air and there is a driver inside who is trying to uh, apply the accelerator, then only the back wheels will rotate. Okay, so that's what a rear wheel drive is. All the engine power rotates the, or provides the omega for the back tires. Okay, so uh, other tire, the rear one is not visible in this picture. So imagine this capital F is the total force acting on both the tires together. So on each tire, it would be F by two. Okay, uh, weight acts from the center of mass and normal reaction from this N1 is the normal reaction on both the front tires together and N2 is for both the rear or back tires together. Okay, so this is the picture. Distance between the tires, let's say is L and the height of the center of mass is H. Now, as the car moves along a level straight road, there is a rotational equilibrium for the car about center of mass. There's no rotation as you could see, which means the torque about center of mass for the rear wheel drive car should be zero, which is a very simple looking torque equation. And since he said in the question that the height of this uh, wheel, he, oh, sorry, so height of the center of mass is very small, negligible, you can read the question, h tends to zero, your n1 and n2 in this problem should be equal to each other and mg by two. Now, there are two stages to this rear wheel drive car when it starts from rest. One is the stage one when it has to accelerate using kinetic friction. Okay, so initial slipping occurs in stage one for t less than or equal to t naught. Okay, and for T greater than T naught, let's suppose we are supposed to find this T naught at which the slipping stops and the force of friction becomes static in nature. Okay, so in stage one, since it is kinetic in nature, the value of the frictional force should be mu into N1 or N2. It doesn't matter. I should have written N2 because I have marked here, but since I've got N1 and N2, I think I am excused here with the typo. Okay, so the total acceleration is therefore given by total friction force itself, which is kinetic in nature for less than t naught seconds, which we'll try to ascertain. So since it's a constant acceleration motion, V is equal to U plus AT, U being zero, you should be able to judge this for T less than or equal to T naught. So I'm again emphasizing T naught is the time when it starts slipping. We are yet to find that value. Okay, right. So this is the stage one when the slipping occurs. Now, before we move to stage two, let's try to find out what's the value of the T naught from the given information in the question. Okay, so how to find T naught? Now, uh, look at this particular picture. You should realize that the back wheels are joined by an axle from inside and the power that is delivered, uh, he said P, is delivered to both the tires uniformly. Okay, so each tire gets a power of P by two. That power comes from the torque near the axle, which tries to rotate this wheel. 
Okay, right. Since the power is constant and uh, the, the value of this particular omega is going to be a constant. Okay, right. So on each rear wheel, which is given massless, the value of tau net should be equal to zero. All this I am able to say because the wheels FBD contains no mass. That's what is given in this question. Real life tires or real life car tires is not going to be in this condition. Okay, right. The so condition given in the question ascertains that the net torque should be zero and omega has to be a constant. Okay, right. So what are the two torques that are therefore available? One from the engine and one from the road. Both of them magnitude wise should cancel out each other. Okay, so that's what I have written here. And I'll multiply both sides of this equality with an omega, which I already said is a constant because of zero inertia or mass of the tire. Then omega multiplies with the torque provided by engine, that becomes the power. Okay, and since I'm writing it for one wheel, the value of that power developed by or delivered to each wheel is P by two. What is torque of friction on each 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 wheel, it should be F by two, which we already wrote in the previous page as mu mg by four into R, let's say is the radius of the tire, right? Into omega, the multiplication that I did. So the value of omega, which I am claiming is constant because of massless nature of the tire comes out to be this, where small r is the radius of the tire. Okay, right. Now at t is equal to t naught, whenever the slipping stops, the value of VCM should be equal to R omega. So you could see the value of R omega from here, which is two pi by mu mg can be equated to the value of VCM that we got in the previous expression by substituting for T naught. Okay, so mu g t was given. So I'll substitute T naught. I claim this VCM should be equal to this R omega. And you could see R nicely got canceled. It has nothing to do with the radius of the tires, even though he has mentioned the tires radius is small. So the value of T naught comes out to be this. So we have not only found out the a relation for the velocity as a function of time, but also we found up till what time that relation is valid. Okay, now with this confidence and the value of T naught, let's move to the no slipping condition, which is the stage two for the rear wheel drive. Okay, now in stage two, whenever the slipping stops, the value of the F that is acting from the road is going to be static in nature. Okay, right. And in this scenario, let look at the right side top of the uh, screen. The velocity is already V naught that we got at the end of T naught seconds. And imagine it goes for T equal to T seconds, the velocity acquired, let's say is V. That's what we are supposed to find as a function of time. From this stage to this stage, which is a period of T minus T naught, I'll try to apply work energy theorem. What's the confidence I'm getting? Why didn't I apply work energy theorem in the stage one? In stage one, since kinetic friction is acting, there will be heat dissipated, whereas static friction doesn't do work. So I can say only work done by the engine or the power delivered by the engine would be used to increase the kinetic energy of the car and FS doesn't do any work. That's the confidence I have in stage two to use work energy theorem. So if a constant power is delivered over a period of T minus T naught, the work done by the internal forces of the engine would be this, and that would be helpful in changing the kinetic energy of the uh, car. And I'm not taking the rotational velocity because the inertia of tires is neglected, only translational kinetic energy. And substitute for the value of T naught that you got in the previous slide, V naught from the previous slide, and rearrange, you get the value of velocity. And this velocity is valid for T greater than T naught. And that's how you see the answer given in the book is a twofold function, one for less than T naught and another one for greater than T naught, where T naught itself, we have found the value. Okay, I hope uh, you understood the problem number 37. Okay, so let's move forward. Problem 20, 29 from check your understanding has two parts and the rear wheel drive part is the same actually. So I'm not going to cover that one up. It's the same thing. I'll write the final answer from the uh, 37th question itself. Okay, so let's drive directly jump into the check your understanding 29 four wheel drive. Okay, so let's read the question first. Okay, so this is the question. Motor of a toy car, this time he's taking a toy car, of mass 1 kg delivers a constant power P is equal to 50 watt. The coefficient of friction between a horizontal floor and the tires of the car is mu equal to 0 0.5. Calculate the time required to accelerate the car from rest to a speed of 20 meter per second on this floor. Consider both types of the toy, four wheel drive and rear wheel drive. For simplicity, ignore masses of the wheels and the air resistance and consider center of gravity of the car equidistance from all the wheels and very close to the floor. All the conditions given are matching with the previous question. So for the rear wheel drive part, I'll, 
I'll be able to use the previous solution. Okay, so this one we have already done. So let's directly jump into the four wheel uh, condition, four wheel drive condition. By now you should understand that the four wheel drive means the engine powers all the wheels now. Okay, right. Which means whatever power capital P is there, now that's get distributed to all four wheels. Not only that, the friction actually from the road is going to act from all the four wheels. Okay, right. So the value of F this way, the value of the F this way, and N1 and N2. Okay, right. So this is mg. And this time, obviously, the value of the acceleration is going to be double as compared to what we had in the previous case, because you have force acting on all the four wheels, it's driven by four wheels, it's a more powerful car. Okay, so there will be a change in the calculation of v and t naught. And the value of v is instead of mu g by two, it's mu g into t and t less than or equal to t naught, this t naught also will change in terms of power p, which will try to ascertain. So let's move to the next page where we'll ascertain the value of t naught by comparing it with rear wheel. So this is like a nice revision of the previous problem. Okay, so in a rear wheel drive where f by two only acted here on the back tires, the F by two now in the four wheel will act on all the four tires. Okay, the power P in this rear wheel toy car gets distributed to only two tires and whereas here it goes to four tires. So here the P by two is equal to the torque into omega that I wrote in the previous page. This time P by four is equal to torque into omega on the four wheel drive car. Okay, so the value of V naught, as I said, it is mu G by two into T naught. And here it is mu naught is mu G t naught. Okay, so from v naught and omega relation, these two, do, we don't get this first, we actually equate v naught equal to r omega naught at a t naught stage, then you get the value of t naught here, which we found out last time. And by substituting the numericals given in this 29th question, you get eight seconds, substitute this eight seconds back into this v naught, you get 20 meter per second. That means in this rear wheel toy, rear wheel drive toy, the slipping starts from eight seconds. And by the time slipping starts, the velocity reached is already 20 meter per second. And that itself should be the answer because he has asked what is the time taken for, uh, sorry, what is the uh, time taken for the velocity to reach 20? It's exactly matching with the uh, time taken for slipping. Okay, so that problem we have done already. So the four wheel drive where the changes will happen, you could see the value of time changes. Okay, so this is two seconds. And that's what happens in a four wheel drive, the velocity increase or whatever is happening with or the slipping condition will be reduced, the wear and tear on the cars would be reduced. Okay, so this two seconds when you substitute it back, you only get 10 meter per second. Since the question asked for developing a velocity of 20 meter per second, you need to go a bit further in this four wheel drive situation. Okay, so which we will do as you might have guessed, from that 10 meter per second to further 20 meter per second without slipping, I'll use work energy theorem because that value of 2F doesn't do work after T naught, okay? So the P into T minus T naught is equal to half M into V square minus V naught square is the familiar looking equation. And you substitute P given value of V naught we found in the previous slide for four wheel drive is 10 meter per second. Velocity that you need to rise it to is 20 and the value of t naught you found was two seconds and you substitute it will be mere five seconds so you can get the car to 20 meter per second in a much smaller time in a four wheel drive right as compared to a two wheel drive in a simplistic model that we have taken many more parameters will be taken into account in the actual real engineering of the car but this is the basic foundation of a rear wheel versus a four wheel drive okay right so take up a practice problem it's just a continuation of the build up 37 problem. So can you calculate the heat dissipated due to friction as a function of time from the start in the build up 37 problem? And please comment your answer using numericals from the 29th problem. So that means just take the rear wheel drive situation and up, uh, whatever time t, the heat dissipated is happening and that you might have guessed is due to slipping as a function of time in numerical values, assume it's a toy car, uh, try to comment your answer in the uh, comment box below. I would be replying to your answers. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the understanding of the rear wheel versus four wheel drives. Okay, and you can uh, see the rest of the important series that are there in this particular channel, right? All the links of these particular series playlists 
links are in the description below. Please do thoroughly enjoy them. Try to play two or three videos per day in sequence in a particular topic wise, and you will be enriched in the problem solving techniques in physics and also will fall in love with the uh, 11th and 12th class JE physics. Okay, right. So uh, in case you have liked this video, please do give it a like. The liked videos get pushed to more audience and help me get more subscribers and develop my channel. Please do share it with your peers in Telegram and WhatsApp group. And please do request them to come and watch the video. Just uh, try to not force them. I think I'm confident enough with my uh, quality content that if they watch for two or three minutes itself, one or two videos, uh, I think they will be hooked. I'm pretty confident. And thanks for showing that confidence in me and the love and support. And uh, it, I'm always grateful to you people and see you in the next video.